go there or you can go to the nearest guy but he is absolutely horrible or you have to travel 40 minutes away to a hospital which has got one specialist who comes only between 3 and 4 you will be there at 245 waiting for him why because you want that problem solved same thing you have a legal problem your legal problem may be multifold but if it is a property related guy you won't go to a corporate law person if it is a corporate law person you won't go to a gst lawyer if it is a gst person you won't go to an income tax lawyer if it is an income tax problem you won't go to a criminal lawyer so like that you will need to develop the very deep skill set and specialists for yourself if you want your client to take seriously which is where i come to the people aspect of it as consultant whatever area i choose i need to have deep expertise in it i can't have i know marketing also i know finance also i know strategy also i know organization behavior also i know this also i know this also i am a jack of all but master of none in a consulting world in a serious consulting world that works for some time but then the client will say then you will have to tell the client for this i will get my partner who is deep skill set into this so in the future too deep domain knowledge and domain skill set somebody referred to industry sector specialist that's what we call as domain knowledge and domain expertise SMEs, subject matter experts. It can be as mun as uh, I wouldn't call it easy. As simple as accounting special subject matter expertise, or tax subject matter expertise, or foreign exchange subject matter expertise, or subject matter expertise in automobile. Subject matter expertise in supply chain. Subject matter expertise in operations, delivery models, HR, culture building. subject matter expertise so if any of you want to venture into this consulting world you got to determine yourself as to what is the skill set that you want to develop for yourself and you're going to go dive deep into it when you do that okay you can command the price you want and you can command the attention of the people whose problems you need to solve in the future for consulting that is not going to change that will still remain relevant till time immemorial otherwise i don't want to talk to a generalist who will prescribe me one antibiotic and one painkiller for my back problem that will solve the problem for two days for me it will not solve the problem on a sustainable basis second issue another issue clients the core the reason why the consultants exist and they will remain in the future also clients are the reason why consulting exists in that scenario you need to help the client solve the problem on a sustainable basis in this sustainable basis when i say i am not meaning environment and social not not that sustainability when i say sustainability it the problem has to be solved for a very long period of time which means your solution cannot be a bandaid and you can only come up with a solution which is not a bandaid if you are a subject matter expertise you will only be able to solve the problem for a customer in or in a in a non bandaid format if you exactly know which skill set to use when to use it whose button to press to make that problem solved very critical in doing this okay imagine the whole spectrum of consulting will you know everything yourself we won't so in solving a particular problem or in addressing a particular issue you will require support from more than yourself in the consulting parlance we call them alliances we call them what i would say uh, subject matter experts we call them 
advisors in whichever shape and form you want to call them. That means for this particular problem which the customer has got, I am there. I have got a couple of project managers, but I need SAS or I need Microsoft or I need SAP or I need Oracle or I need somebody like that to solve that problem. So the alliances network, previously the it was like, you know, you call the guy, he put 15 people on the job, he analyzed the data to death and he spoke to a lot of people, took the same data into, into PPT and told back to you, all that is changing. All that is changing as we speak. Today, the customer is saying, tell me how to solve the problem. It doesn't matter where it is. So if I need to bring in 15 other people from an alliance point of view, that is my job. So the consulting of the past did not actually had this. It's not as if the concept was not there, but it was not so prevalent because people were a little afraid to kind of share the client with somebody else. Today, that is not the case. Today, they are okay saying that this is your client. This is my client. Let's solve the problem together. So the entire alliance network of where the expertise lies, which you don't have, comes into play. Uh, I will put this, I will explain this in the form of a different analogy, which all of you would have seen. How many of you have seen Grey's Anatomy? How many of you have seen Chicago Med? Chicago Med, another doctor serial. More of a house guys, okay? House, that guy comes and says, this is the problem, this is what the... So his ability, in house his ability, okay? His ability to diagnose as to what exactly is the issue is very good. But is he the person solving the diagnosis? He gets somebody else to do it. How many of you have seen good doctor? A lot of you have seen good doctor. See, in there, it is not the one person. There are five people who come to solve that particular problem. Consulting has become like that in the today and in the future it will become even more like that. Now imagine this. You want to be a consultant. So you go deep on a subject matter expertise. Correct? Auto, manufacturing, GCCs, or you know, technology, media, telecommunications. You go deep into it. I want to do a PhD in it. So do it. But even in that, you can't solve the problem yourself. You may be the best person to solve the question, but you require five more people to support that. I will give you another example why this is more critical. Okay. Have anybody has seen the movie Core? C O R E. You have seen the movie Core. Anybody else? You have seen the movie Core. I would advise you to see that movie Core. Okay. I think it is available in Prime or something like that, or Disney Hotstar, or whatever it is. If you don't get it, just get the DVD and watch it. Okay. There, the problem is the leader is appointed by of a person who knows what exactly needs to be done. And he is not leader material. He is not the guy who has led 100 people and done. He is a simple scientist. But he is appointed as a leader. In that movie, okay, they want to manage the internet. They don't go to the Caltech and the all those institutes to say that or the IIT saying that Give me one net expert which I need to solve this. They go to one hacker who can manage this. The reason I'm giving this example is you don't know where the skill set lies if you need to solve the problem. So in the future of consulting, you will need to keep your eyes and ears open for these kind of skill sets where you can actually solve the problem of the customer. Because the customer is interested in solving the problem. He is not interested in whether you are doing it or you are getting five other people to help you support to do it. Critical aspect for all of us to remember. Now I will come to what we call people. Somebody said work-life balance. I presume all, I was told that all of you have got five plus years of experience before you came here. Correct? True, right? In these five years, how was your work-life balance? No, you are laughing. I'm just asking a very serious question. In these five years, how was your work-life balance? 
when you say good because of covid i could sit at home and do nothing ha huh? started good but not not sustained okay covid up even after covid we are 24/7 available no what's the problem so i don't know okay anybody else work life balance kaisa tha how was it during your 5 years so why are we talking about work life balance if it was good why are we talking about it ha huh? it's poor in consulting it is said to be poor in consulting let me ask you another question you had a session on mna right before mine what happened in 2008 financial crisis happened the fed chairman calls jamie diamond you got to buy bear stearns at 2 dollars per stock i was in jp morgan at that time no i was not i was in new york at that time i had worked in jp morgan before that you know how many days they got to do a due diligence on bear any guess how many days they got to do a due diligence on bear before jamie jaiman could agree to the 2 dollars 2 dollars 3 days they got over weekend so now tell me work life balance will you have work life balance over that weekend no because i know because the many of the cfos the global cfos of many of the businesses were called Three days you sit in this damn room and review bear stones, financials before you can give me comfort. What is good, what is ugly, and what is bad. During that time, work life balance ko tail lene gaya. Got it? I'm being very serious about it. I'm being very serious about it. So if you are a consultant, if there is a transaction going on, work life balance will not come into play. will not come into play okay i got enough people somebody actually yesterday uh, we kpmg actually supports uh, under privileged girls to study so we call it the aspire program as part of our entire giving back to the community uh, program so we select few girls from lot of the slums in gurgaon in bombay in bangalore and we pay their school fees we give them tutoring we give them mentoring and it's tough they got to earn they got to get a certain level of percentage in 8th standard before we can support them in 9th standard if they don't get the percentage they we don't support them in 9th standard then they have to get the same percentage in 9th standard to get into 10th standard then we support them then 11th and 12th and then for graduation and if they graduate very well we employ them so few girls we have employed like them. so one girl yesterday asked me this question how hard did you study for your ca because that is one of their aspirations right somebody wants to be a doctor somebody wants to be an accountant somebody wants to be an engineer or architect or whatever it is so how hard did you study when i was thinking about that i said your work life balance question abhi aa raha hai okay and all of you are pretty young in your career all of you are reasonably young in your career i would say so if you want to achieve something and you want to get the skill set specialist in whichever area you want to do there is nothing called day and night there is nothing called work life balance but having said that it is not as if it is all work you got to figure out when to balance what you got to figure out when to balance what i can give you my own example covid uh, we have about 35000 people in india and kpmg when covid hit March twelfth, two thousand twenty, is when the decision was taken to all of us will be working from home. Nobody will come to office, which means my network, my IT uh, BCP plan, everything got kicked in. And on Monday morning, everybody will log on remotely. Imagine the stress that puts on the system. Imagine the stress it puts on everybody else. Okay, and during that time, for the first. somebody sent me a question on
bani somebody said that what is how do you how can companies prepare for bani world in context of future fragile ecosystem bani full form bani vuka full form bani is a different word it's called brittle anxious non linear and incomprehensible brittle because it's it's not it's it's not strong enough it's fragile anxious when people are very anxious they got this whole what is going to happen what is going to happen non linear means it's not predictable incomprehensible we don't understand it okay covid was that imagine we are running a business everybody is working from home clients don't see us clients are also working from home but i got to charge them fees i got to send a bill to them say that this is what i did for you okay and the clients have to pay and you got to manage the entire operations for 35000 people across the country during that time there was no work life balance i was 24 by 7 my team of 16 people who was managing this was 24 by 7 once we got to set mode of doing stuff we started taking the balances out in getting the balance in life out so people very critical from a consulting point of view they are not going to change people well being is very important work life balance is very important but it depends upon the situation that you are in it is not standard that mai 9 baje jaunga 6 baje ghar aa jaunga and i will have dinner at home it will happen but it will not happen every day so work life balance from a people etc point of view depends upon the situation that you are in and it has to be defined by you it cannot be defined by the organization that you are working in or the client that you are working in if there is a client deliverable period that's more critical because we exist as consultants we exist because of clients we don't exist because of what i do because our clients are willing to pay money for what i do i exist clear when i talk about people again i got 5 minutes that's what my watch tells me talk about people again the delivery model and the business model is evolving on a daily basis again covid example she said covid was bad etc types but actually covid was bad in some things covid was fantastic in few things it changed everybody's perspective of how work can be done it changed the perspective that attendance is not important output is important it changed the perspective that you don't need to wear a tie and a white shirt and a suit and come to the office you can be in your pajamas or in your shorts and t-shirts and still deliver that same value what you do etc it changed the way the global delivery model works everybody thought i have to be sitting here and doing the work suddenly california engineers figured out that the same damn thing they are doing for 200000 dollars per annum is being done by 40000 dollars in a guy by a person in bangalore the same technical evaluation of what they did the world evolved like that so the delivery model changed for life permanently the delivery model has changed today i got a million square feet of office space it is only occupied 25% so any business rational person will say are yaar chhod do office ko khali kar do give up the rent it doesn't work like that the decision is not that easy because tomorrow it might change slowly slowly people have figured out what how to do and what to do so in the in, in the future from a consulting point of view the delivery model the change is permanent now how you evolve the delivery model now how you make it work for every situation that you face is critical and is very important i know i am at the end of my time and i said i will not leave you four minutes for question that's exactly what i have done four minutes of question okay but i think i have covered i wanted to cover digital transformation skill set long term sustainable people oriented this low code no code situation is also not helping it's creating a absolutely new way of thinking skills tools critical alliances talked about clients 
in the center super critical because that's why we exist evolving needs delivery models subject matter expertise focus a very sharp focus of your skill set is very critical i think these will not change in the future few things might change but i would now open it up for questions if you have any yes Of general, we have multiple specialists for any problem. Hello? Yeah, we'll have if we have multiple specialists to solve like a client's set of problems, wouldn't a generalist be better at coordinating those specialists? He will only coordinate. He's not going to solve the problem. We got here Anura Keys and HR people specialist. So if I have a cultural people, I will have to call him. I will not get, I will not, you will not call me to solve that problem. I will have to call him, not me. But first, they need someone to figure out that it's an HR problem. That, that will happen. Okay. You will figure out, it could be an HR problem. It could be a process problem. It could be a people problem. It could be a techno problem. We don't know. Mm -hmm. But when you get two, three people into the room to really think about it, You'll figure out this is less of a technology problem. This is more of a cultural problem. So we said the whole focus will shift of the consultant, of the client to say that, okay, get this team to help me do the thinking process on it. I'm not saying generalists are all useless. They are critical. They are important from, but from a problem solving point of view, you've got to get the deep domain expertise to help you solve the problem. So, yes, anybody else? Uh, sir, uh, I'm Nirnay Puchunde. Uh, sir, the recent uh, global pandemic port shutdown in Shanghai, Russia-Ukraine war, and the palm oil supply disruptions from Indonesia, they have highly impacted businesses. So uh, an article on the KPMG website talks about going beyond resilience and introducing uh, anti-fragility into the supply chain. So can you put some uh, light on what anti-fragility is and what's its potential in uh, saving businesses in times of stress. So what you're talking about is something called geopolitical risk. Okay. What I mean by geopolitical risk is something is happening somewhere in the world that has got a chain of events which is likely to impact us. And in that whole process, somebody will control something my country needs, oil, for example. Okay. So that's geopolitical risk. So all these events have got a direct or indirect bearing on how the business gets impacted. Okay. If you actually do, uh, how many of you have done enterprise risk management kind of projects ever in your life, in your five years of work? Ex? When you do an enterprise risk management, you actually take geopolitical risk as one of the risks to say that if any geopolitical event were to happen in the world, would it impact me? Point one. If the geopolitical risk, if you actually, how many of you have done Peter's five forces model? All of port, oh, porters, sorry, porters. So you got customers, you got vendors, you got suppliers, you got your, uh, so everything will get impacted depending upon how the business model is and which, where your dependency is. So if tomorrow China, Taiwan or China, US kind of an interaction were to happen, it will impact all of us because our supply chain is dependent on few things, which is what happened when the vaccines were happening, which is what happened when pharmaceutical companies were dependent for a lot on the API drug in China. So somebody had to uh, de-risk themselves to do something in India. So like that, when we are saying it's a fragile system, okay, it is a fragile system because as in consulting, everything cannot be solved by us. We need alliance partners to do a lot of stuff. For our own business model, everything cannot be done by me or done by us. We have to rely on so many suppliers and so many other uh, products for us to really survive. If anything gets impacted here, my input output gets impacted. So that fragile system needs to be managed and kept always at abeyance. That's what we are meaning. Because in a geopolitical scenario, it will impact. And as the borders are kind of will disappear, some people are actually drawing very hard borders. Some people are removing their borders. So from a business point of view, if you look at it, the customer is all over the place today. I'll give you an example, WhatsApp. 
majority of the customers are in india facebook majority customers are in india google majority customers are in india here so for us if if they need to if something happens to google taxation or whatever it is we will also get impact so that's the geopolitical system that we are operating in from a business point of view that fragility from a business for each business is to evaluate that and ensure that they have backups the risk management system works like that that's what we are meaning by that i hope i have answered your question sorry any other questions before i, I my colleague here is waiting my consulting colleague here is waiting yes please go ahead good afternoon sir sir like you mentioned that you have to be more of a specialist than being a generalist when it comes to consulting but in an ever evolving and changing times it happens so that you will be a specialist of one and you'll probably be missing out on something which is with the time as evolution happens there's going to be a change in that idea or that philosophy then how does kpmg as such keeps up with that like uh, my colleague here vijay was saying that being a generalist maybe gives you a bigger purview on that but being a specialist how do you not miss out on these things you don't miss out you work with others to make it happen it's not as if you are working on your own cocoon and shell you have to work with others to make it happen so in that bargain you will learn for example if i have a if come come if a client has a problem and they say look i am not able to get things done internally externally so one diagnosis when this whole diagnosis happens one diagnosis could be that culture of the company is a problem one diagnosis could be the internal processes are not very good so we need to strengthen them that could be a second diagnosis so if the culture is not good we'll call an hr specialist or a culture specialist and say okay this is what you need to fix internal processes it could be finance it could be hr it could be operations whatever you get different different people to do it so you can be one person to fix one part of the problem but you are actually working with a wider team you will learn in that process it's not as if you will wear blinkers and if i if i want if i'm doing hr my aur kuch dekhunga hi nahi that's not going to happen that's not going to happen because you will also need the wider perspective that as you mature in the consulting world as you become senior enough your spectrum also widens okay you are a specialist there's no doubt about it but your spectrum also widens today it doesn't mean that my uh, 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 what i would say a business consulting guy goes and meets a customer he he does it not as if he cannot recognize it's a tax problem it's not as if he cannot recognize it seems to be a regulatory problem that they are facing so while there is a business implication we need to get the regulatory guys also come into play classic case is gst gst is not a tax issue it's a supply chain issue the whole supply chain got impacted from e invoicing etc everybody thought it's a tax problem no it's not a tax problem tax is one component of it so the tax guys have to understand business and supply chain to make it happen the supply chain guys have to understand the requirements of gst to, to make that happen so while i am a tax specialist or a supply chain specialist i need to understand the other ecosystem to other parts of the ecosystem to make it happen so it's not as if you are a generalist only will make it happen a generalist is separate i know i am running out uh, of time thank you mr vidyanathan uh, yep. it was thank such you. an insightful session i would now like to call my colleague arvind to deliver a word of thanks So, on behalf of uh, XLRI and the cohort of uh, PGDM GM, uh, we would like to e uh, extend uh, our sincere gratitude for being part of Fulcrum, for having made the journey to come visit us at the campus, and uh, being here in the physical form after all that we have been through in COVID. Uh, it makes this even more special, sir. And uh, I'm sure uh, this uh, address has reached us at the right time. where we are at the juncture in our career where we need to understand the importance of specialization while being aware how we need to work together in alliance networks and have that ability to be sure of what you're doing but being able to work with other people to ultimately arrive at solutions for your customers so with that in mind sir i think we have learned a lot from here of why we need consultants 
and how to provide a long term solution and with that attitude i think all of us will be moving forward so thank you for this address sir thank you sir i would now like to call jalpreet to deliver momento to sir sir please thank you dilpreet thank you sir good afternoon everyone we already know that organizational transformation is a new constant for all now but the success is far from guaranteed new research is indicating that giving specific focus to a series of complex human factors can increase the probability of success to more than 70% so this comes to our next theme of this discussion shaping successful business transformation with humans at center to discuss further on this and other aspects of humanization we have illustrious speaker mr anurag malik with us anurag malik leads eys people consulting workforce advisory business in india he also leads eys organization of people field of play for europe middle east india africa which gives him the opportunity to drive growth for eys people consulting solutions across these regions he is passionate about working with organizations to bring humans at center of their largest transformation programs he has spent more than 20 years in people consulting and has advised more than 300 organizations across india us europe middle east southeast asia in areas like people strategy hr technology hr transformation organizational design leadership development mergers and acquisitions performance management leadership development he is passionate about learning especially using technology to help organizations identify skills for the future build digital capabilities at scale and drive digital transformation he has also led eys skilling business in the past which has delivered employability skilling to more than 1 lakh people across india and other southeast regions he truly believes in the power of applying next generation technologies for solving new and conventional people or hr related problems he enjoys incubating mentoring and supporting hr technology startups i'm pleased to announce that anurag is a pro graduate from xlri prior to that he has also worked with arthur anderson in the hr consulting practice and along with that in asian pains as a part of their corporation hr function i kit along with my batch of xlri pgdm gm 20 to 23 our heartiest welcome to you sir welcome back to the alma mater once again now i would request pallavi on our behalf to provide a bouquet to mr anurag we have a fireside chat session planned to take it forward this afternoon sir before that i will hand it over to you to address the batch a bit then with all your permission we can start sir since it's a fireside chat uh, maybe i'll just take a couple of minutes uh, just introducing myself uh, adding to the long long introduction i i've never had this long an introduction so i was absolutely loving it sitting it uh, sitting out there but um, maybe i'll just take a minute more uh, and uh, since it's a fireside chat i won't give you a lecture uh, you know hopefully let the questions flow but uh, pleasure being back on campus uh, we're looking forward to our 25th year homecoming next year so so yeah this is what uh, you know you look like after 20 years plus in consulting so you can make a choice thank you 
how, how many of you uh, how many of you are actually considering a career in consulting any i mean saying strategy finance ops so what about uh, i mean i'm sure there are some hands going up just to being kind to me but okay that's still 50% right 50% odd uh, people okay you know i was talking to another friend of mine who was coming here uh, i won't name him he works for a competitor firm and he was asking me anurag that i'm going back to excel and i'm going to talk about consulting so what do we need to do i said uh, you need to do something to get the 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 romance of consulting as a profession back because i remember you know so i i joined anderson arthur anderson uh, maybe many of you were kids or not even born uh, 2004 is no no 2002 enron happened and uh, anderson disappeared so so uh, anderson and our times were people, consultants they would they would come into campus wearing starch white shirts i mean better starch white shirts than this uh, black suits and we would be absolutely in awe of those people uh, so so consulting was right up there uh, in terms of a career choice but i actually didn't join uh, consulting from campus i was told that you got to start in a good corporate environment and learn so i was told asian paints wow it's the company to learn the basics the processes and and i took that advice seriously and i i'm glad i took that i mean i absolutely loved that company but uh, again 3 years later uh, the starched white shirt and the black suits were back anderson was back and we got them uh, working for us on a assignment and i said i've got to do this i mean just i i i i had starry eyes as those people would come in and you know talk uh, strategy and talk stuff like that so i joined anderson in 2001 3 years out of campus uh, really looking forward to uh, to a long career with them and i remember my first project was in the middle east i aramco uh, they they sent me to do a consulting project with aramco and i was early morning 7:30 i was sitting in the loo sitting inside and my colleague knocked the door he said anurag i said what he said we are ey now so yes yes so that's how i i joined ey or i became a part of ey and when i came back to india so so i mean the jokes apart some of you would uh, know that uh, ey acquired anderson businesses in india and ron and happened and you know that unfortunately great firm uh, arthur anderson was coming apart and fortunately we found home in ey and when i came back to india somebody pointed on said you know that guy that guy is going to be your boss so 20 years back i didn't make a choice about joining ey mm. i didn't choose the boss i wanted to or i would have but yeah here is where i am so everything i say i'm i'm just telling you everything i say take it with a pinch of salt so um, i i i think it's karma it's it's god's wish that uh, kept me going but great to be back here uh, do i need to sit am i are you okay standing I, i'm i'm okay so out of the just before you get started i just wanted to understand uh, you know the people sitting here a little more uh, so how many of you are excited about strategy consulting as an opportunity okay uh, operation supply chain consulting okay uh, technology any kind of technology consulting wow okay uh, i don't assume the hr batch would be here so you anybody here who's on a, uh looking at a career in people consulting oh we, there are a few hr students here okay fair uh, thank you that gives me a good sense of the the group so i can i can uh, try and take questions or at least share perspectives that i have yes yes sir. we will start with the first question so the first question comes as you have worked in other industries as well as consulting so what is your advice to students as they evaluate between their industries and versus upcoming consulting career after the way i introduce myself they're not going to take my advice seriously they'll say you know you 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 landed here by chance and but okay um, intelligence through hindsight um actually uh, corporate careers let me use that word um, and consulting careers are um, 
are fairly different, are significantly different. Okay, and um, I won't I won't go into uh, any deep perspectives. Let me just start by sharing some very basics of uh, maybe my experiences, people I've known who've done fantastically well in consulting versus industry. What what are the two or three differences? And I, maybe you should use these as litmus for your litmus test on whether you're really cut out for consulting or not. I think uh, point number one, what differentiates a consulting career from a more traditional corporate career is penchant for problem solving. I know it's a cliche, but I, I can tell you, I, 20 years, what keeps me going in consulting is I genuinely believe um, I, 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 I live for solving problems. Okay, I, and I say it loudly. I say it unbashedly, shamelessly. I live for solving problems. Consulting is about ensuring that you've got a strong problem-solving orientation, right? Uh, I'm not talking about product consulting, so uh, I'm not. Let me not make a generic statement. But I think if you believe, with whatever some of you may may have some experience of the industry, some of you may have just uh, had exposure to graduate and postgraduate programs. If problem solving is what drives you, if you know what what really gets you excited is you know a problem statement, a challenge, solutioning, whiteboarding that I'm sure a lot of you do, and you get excited by variety of problem day in and day out, you know doesn't tire you down. I think that's a good litmus test because there's no doubt about it. Consulting, uh, non product consulting. I mean, whether you're looking at core strategy firms, you're looking at the big fours, you're looking at specialist consulting firms. I think problem solving is core to it. And enjoying problem solving is very, very critical. Think about it. Run that litmus test. Second litmus test, I always say, is around how much do you enjoy ambiguity, right? Um, and again, a very important litmus test. There's nothing uh, good or bad about it. Uh, I think consulting uh, provides you with a epitome of ambiguity. On a, even 20 years into the career, I can tell you, uh, you walk into meetings, uh, the context is different. It's a new sector, a new organization. It'll be problem statements you may never faced before. Okay. Uh, if ambiguity drives you, it, it excites you, it doesn't tire you down, you know, because you're in that scenario day in and day out. You, 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 you enjoy the, the excitement that comes with, with ambiguity. I think it's a very good lit litmus test again. Uh, again, I'm not saying it's good or bad. Uh, honestly, uh, uh, you know, corporate roles, you know, from, uh, you know, the F top FMCG organization to the banks, I think they offer far more choice, far more variety in terms of career uh, options, uh, uh, far better structure. I think, but if, if, you, if you think you close your eyes, whatever experience you, if you had, if you believe you're, you 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 you'd like you know a career a job that's got to do with ambiguity learning different situ scenarios think about consulting and the last thing is structure i think more early years uh, difference between a traditional corporate role and consulting is that uh, you don't really have a jd you you're not a manager consumer banking a manager supply chain etc cetera, etc cetera. you join a team uh, on a day to day month to month uh, quarter to quarter basis, your role becomes, you know, gets evolved based on projects that you get an opportunity on, projects that you get deployed on, right? So you define your uh, job description, so to say, over a period of time based on what you like, uh, what you're passionate about, and what opportunities that you get and you can make out of that. So long answers, but I'm, I just thought I'll uh, give you some basics on uh, litmus test on on helping you choose whether consulting works for you or not. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And the next question, I will come up with a technology-based question as half of my batch is having a technology background. So some of my questions will revolve around that. It's hard to overstate the impact of cloud computing. What was once an intriguing technological option is now an essential element of digital transformation. With an advancement in cloud computing, the ability of computing power is more than ever before. How does this change the future of consulting solutions that can be offered to our clients? Okay, I'll, I'll specifically talk about uh, cloud computing, uh, but uh, 
I, I saw, uh, you know, few of you, maybe 20%, 30% are looking at uh, technology consulting careers. Fantastic time to be in technology consulting. Absolutely fantastic time. I think uh, the way uh, 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 it's growing today, the, the kind of opportunity is coming with cloud consulting and web 3.0 and AL and MI and what consultants are doing to help organizations apply these technologies. And I, hopefully I'll share some of that. I think fantastic time to be, uh, to uh, look at a consulting career in, in technology consulting. Uh, you asked about tech, cloud uh, computing. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sure uh, many of you uh, come from technology backgrounds already, um, or most of you would understand that uh, cloud computing has changed the fundamental paradigm of computing. I think, uh, uh, gone are the days where, or largely gone are the days where organizations are buying or building on-prem infrastructure, uh, building uh, systems which are highly customizable on-prem to their requirements. I think uh, cloud uh, evolution has changed that dramatically. And it has had a, such a fundamental impact on organizations. You know, Digital transformation is a word that gets used, right? Uh, commonly used and we use it with our clients. If you look at uh, what digital transformation touches upon, I think there are so many things that the the evolution of the cloud world, as we say, have has you know impacted uh, digital transformations in an organizations. Uh, cost, technology costs, uh, agility, you know, speed, uh, uh, the uh, the power of making significant changes as you go along. I think clouds changed a, a lot of that. Uh, let's start with costs. I think uh, uh, if you look at consulting, uh, one of our biggest areas of work today is to help organizations take out anything from 10 to 40% of their technology costs, costs through using uh, cloud, you know, the power of the cloud. Uh, um, uh, it, it has become far more stronger possible to define technology budgets, uh, IT budgets, uh, given the power that it allows. I think uh, what the cloud's also done is, uh, it's actually revolutionized uh, a lot of, you know, bringing to life a lot of the other uh, exponential technologies, AI, big data. I think it's played, made, created a much stronger level playing field uh, uh, for big, small organizations to be able to leverage, deploy, within the, the organizations. So, but given the, the growth of the cloud, uh, uh, things like data security, data privacy have become big, which is again a, a, a big area of work for consulting today. Uh, cloud related data security, data privacy consulting has become very, very big. What has also become big is cloud strategy. So helping organizations migrate to the cloud. So, you know, supply chain operations and cloud migration, HR work, people consulting that I do, what's your cloud strategy for the future? I think it's a it's a very large area of work for consulting organization. Cloud, I think uh, it's also provided a lot of focus now on the quality of the user interface, right? Uh, hence work on UX design, uh, design thinking. I think those are large areas of a consulting firm. What cloud's also done is, uh, I think uh, brought about a very new segment of companies, uh, which I'm sure all of you read about, the SaaS, the uh, IaaS, so infrastructure as a service, platform as a service. I think consulting with these companies around their business models, how to help them fully leverage the power of the cloud. Fantastic. I think the it's one of the fastest growing uh, areas of, within consulting also. Yes, sir. I agree. After COVID, the digital transformation has been Absolutely. multifold as well. This brings to the next question with consulting firms now moving towards end-to-end -end solution delivery from advisory to implementation how do you consult how would the consulting firms planning to cover the implementation part in house or outsourcing the delivery what do you think about it haven't all the speakers addressed this question i think this is the this is the this has been the big theme in consulting for a while now that uh, consultant all kinds of consulting firms have moved from primarily advisory to implementation focus so i'm i'm sure if i was to ask you this question i'll get you know, a synthesis of what, you know, three or four firms say, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll share my perspective. Yes. Um, if I was to look at my journey in consulting, uh, many things have changed over the last 20 years. Uh, 
one big change that's happened is what you're alluding to, which is focus on implementation. I think clients need to look at value creation today is very, very high. Consulting is not only been about advice. It's about saying that, uh, are you partners in value creation or not? Implementation or not? You know, but the interesting part is that um, implementation is also not a generic terminology anymore. Uh, uh, a lot of interesting models have evolved around implementation. So one is a more traditional model where you would say that uh, whatever I, I design for you, whatever I proposed for you, I will now work on helping you implement that. Okay, that's a common model. If I've done a cost reduction program designed for you, I'll help you uh, take those costs out and help you implement in your balance sheet. If I've done a re revenue enhancement strategy for you, I will help you run that strategy with your sales, with your ops folks to show a, you know, a revenue uplift. So that's a traditional now a traditional value creation view of implementation of consulting. But there's another model also. There are a few more models also that have evolved. Another one is actually uh, now consulting firms saying build operate transfer model. That uh, I will use my expertise, my capability to build this process, even build this line of business for you, uh, run it for you, stabilize it for you, and transfer it to you. Uh, extremely common. Uh, uh, I don't know how much of that you're you're hearing in consulting, but uh, we're doing a lot of it, and I'm hearing more. And another third uh, interesting and obvious scenario is managed services. That if I've come in, I've I've worked on your process improvements, I've looked at efficiency improvements, I've I've worked on transformation uh, projects for you. I will also run it as a managed services provider, and hence it's an extension of consulting. So yes, uh, the term implementation has evolved quite, quite, quite dramatically in consulting now. Truly, sir. It's not like I will just not make you dream. I will make your dream come true as well. Thank you, sir. We will move forward to the next cutthroat technology. Major companies across industries, JP Morgan, Nike, Google, and uh, Disney have begun to think about how Web 3.0 will influence their business and what benefits this new technology could unlock. Question is, what is your point of view, future of consulting in this web 3.0 world? Okay. We're getting more specific in, in technology. How many of you are passionate about web 3.0? How many of you have av avid readers? Don't worry, I'm not asking. I'm not going to test your knowledge. But I just want to, just want to test uh, how, how many of you uh, read about web 3.0 have worked on in your previous experiences on technologies platform anybody here okay blockchain okay okay so if you if you've not uh, if you've not really invested in reading learning about uh, web 3.0 do that because the simple answer to her question is it's really impacting all domains today. Okay. Uh, since uh, I, I don't, didn't see so many hands, let me start with a little bit of basics. Uh, maybe some of the, you know, some of you who are more specialists can add on your knowledge on Web 3.0. But you know what I see, the fundamental difference that I saw between Web 1.0 1, 1 to Web 3.0 is that Web 1.0, the interface was largely text-based. So the interface between the human, me and the machine, or us and the machine was largely text-based. You know, you would, you would interact based on text. I think what uh, Web 3.0 has done is that the machine now is able to interpret human actions and human behaviors, right? So it uh, based on commands or actions I input into the interface, whatever interface I'm using, it be a you know, a, a smartphone or it be a, a, you know, my laptop or iPad or whatever, Web 3.0 technologies, uh, the machine is able to interpret my inputs and calibrate what it gives me, throws out uh, based on that input. That's the, that, that's the fundamental difference. And it's a phenomenal difference. So you, you talked about Nike and Google and so on. So at a, again, more layman explanation, uh, uh, you you know the the obvious thing is a Facebook or any anything you consume uh, uh, the content calibrates based on what you consume right uh, that that's the and it's not a uh, an individual sitting backend it's the 
Web 3.0 that calibrates content it throws out based on your preferences and your inputs. Now, this as a concept has again changed things dramatically. And given, uh, I think last couple of years, it's accelerated uh, uh, things in consulting dramatically. One is you spoke about blockchain, AI, machine learning. I think the prof proliferation of some of these technologies have gone up dramatically given the Web 3.0. What Web 3.0 has also done is that it's provided a fantastic interface for marketing. For I mean, it's a it's a fantastic marketing tool. Hyper personalization of what you want to give to uh, you know you provide to users. Okay, maybe I'm I'm getting a little theoretical. Sorry, I I I you know since too many hands didn't go up, I I thought I'll go basic. Let me give you real examples uh, so that uh, some of you are evaluating careers can can understand what do we do. Uh, so EY, uh, our, uh, our firm, and this is a business consulting, technology consulting, people consulting project. One of the uh, paint makers came to us and said, can you create an interface for us that helps users choose paints, okay? Choose uh, wallpapers, choose uh, upholstery based on, the, based on an interface wheel design. They came to EY for that, right? Uh, they didn't go to a what you would call a traditional consulting firm. Fantastic project. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful example of how we are working towards in terms of use, uh, amalgamation of multiple technologies that we're using. We're, we, we're working on consumer behavior from, from one perspective. We've used design thinking uh, to, to ensure that we're presenting the interface. Backend, we are aligning the supply chain to be able to, you know, it throws up options based on what they have. It, it gives an input back to fantastic example of delivering a, a, a consulting project. Another one, uh, uh, food, uh, a, a very, very large food chain uh, wants to replicate what Zomato or Swiggy have, have done over a period of time, maybe do it better. So we are creating an interface for them. Again, same, a food ordering interface, but next generation food ordering. Okay, I'll, I'll not go into specific, it's still like. In the people consulting side, uh, for learning, uh, we today do hyper-personalization using Web 3.a technology. So we've got this platform called Spot Mentor, and it's a learning platform. So we uh, release it out, and somebody would say, I have 100 data scientists, and uh, uh, you know, we, we offer programs to 100 data scientists. The starting point is the same, but based on which program do they first consume, how many hours do they consume, the rest of the, uh, the, the system calibrates the rest of the journey accordingly, right? So, it, you know, what is your, do you li like bite-sized learning, uh, two minutes programs or long programs? Do you like core technology programs? Do you like case studies? Do you want to learn about best practices? So I know I swung from concept to application, but I just thought if you're evaluating careers in, in this area, that's this is the kind, this is a cutting edge typical type of work that's happening using Web 3.0 technologies. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. As we are talking about technology and technology adaptation, that brings to my next question. Looking at the rapid technology adaptation in India, it's on the path of techno-nationalism, where technology is affecting the society and culture of the nation. How does the landscape look like in next 10 years in India and role of human beings in this? What's your thought on that? How many of you feel that technology adoption in India is faster than the developed world or how many of yeah how many of you feel we're faster than the developed world it's third in the world i guess okay and yes. how many you how many of you feel that uh, technology adoption pace of technology adoption we are we're slower than the developed world how many of you feel that yeah let me share my 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 perspective sorry i i want to keep you guys awake so uh, let me, how many of you are interested in cricket? Wow, I okay. I'll come to that also. You know, I'm 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 actually glad so many my my kids abuse me. I were a teenager, so if I talk about cricket at home, and I have two I have twin daughters, they're eight year old. So if I talk about cricket, I get abused at home. So again, delighted that uh, you know this. So. Uh, I'll tell you a story about uh, India and technology adoption from last week. And I'll tell you a story from cricket. So, so I'm deeply passionate about cricket. And uh, I, was watching the, I was watching India's journey at the World Cup very closely. And the day uh, 
India qualified for the semi final. I said I have to be in Adelaide to watch the semi final. So I uh, I actually flew 16 hours to Melbourne since I didn't do my tickets in advance. I couldn't get a connecting flight from Melbourne to Adelaide. So I drove eight hours uh, from Melbourne to Adelaide for that match. So for those of you. Uh, for those of you who don't understand cricket, nah, uh, you know, uh, if if you were to ask a deep, passionate cricket lover about that match, you'll 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 have the person start crying that you know what India did. So I I you know I I I'm one of those who you know who uh, spent 24 hours getting to the Adelaide Cricket Stadium and you know being there for three hours to get India walloped uh, royally. <laughs> but the story is not that. The story is not that. The story is uh, the question. You know, uh, the drive from Melbourne to Adelaide, right? Uh, nine hours, eight or 900 kilometers in Australia, right? A developed country. And uh, after a long, long time, maybe 15, 20 years, I had run a drive in the countryside. So I stopped in small villages. We stopped at, you know, their equivalence of, uh, you know, what, what do we call? Uh, tapri, sorry. Huh? Mm -hmm. Tapri. Sorry, Dhabas, their equivalent of Dhabas, their equivalent of Kelas. We stopped. And, you know, uh, my realization was that we are far ahead when it comes to technology adoption globally. The number of places that we, that we were told that pay in cash was surprising. No, we don't accept uh, anything other than cash. Uh, in India, you go around today, and I, I, I told the story to 100 people in Australia, proudly so, that if you go around in India today, financial services, what's it's done, you know, the power of QR codes, you go to a Tapri Wala, you know, I, I live in Delhi, you're driving uptown in Morena, you stop in a small person spelling, uh, selling, uh, you know, uh, some choti say, shop pay on the shop floor, we'll have a QR code. I think uh, technology adoption in India has been is fortunately been very, very quick and very, very fast. I think we're still, maybe it's the number of years of lag that we have uh, that we're still catching up to. It's, it's very, very fast. Another area, uh, we're doing work on EV technology uh, for, for a client. And uh, again, we were plotting uh, technology adoption around EV technologies in India versus the rest of the markets, global markets. I was amazed in what's happening in the last six months to one year. Once this country takes on to something, uh, I think the, the pace of adoption is fantastic. My, my belief is that uh, from a society point of view, uh, over the next few years, I think we'll be one of the most digitally calibrated, whatever word you might want to use from a technology adoption point of view. And, and you see it happening. I mean, you, you're seeing it happening very fast across you know, corporates, manufacturing, supply chain, operations, sales and marketing. I think it's more the getting the largest society involved in, in becoming a more digitally swap society. I think that's where the, the, it's, but I think the pace is amazing today. No, no doubt about it. Sorry for the cricket example for, and, and sorry for some of you that I reminded you of what happened in Adelaide. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, I also had tickets for the final and I couldn't sell my, so I had, uh, I put on the tricolor and I, sat there among 80,000, you know what, so, so, yeah, yeah, so, so that's what I went through last week. <laughs> Thank you, sir. As we are talking about technology changes and the adaptation, that brings to my next question. How has the consulting as a profession changed over the years amid these changes, financial regulations, technology disruptions? How do you foresee the future in this front? And how does a consultant adapt to such changes? I think I've, I've touched upon some of the aspects of uh, the evolving profession through my, my experiences. I think in terms of financial regulations, there's no, or regulations, sorry, not financial regulations only. I think uh, uh, over the years, one has seen uh, the standards getting defined, the standards that so-called regulate, guide the profession have got uh, well-defined. Uh, uh, definitions in a lot of areas in what constitutes an output, a deliverable, a report. I think some of those standards, it's got very well defined. Standards in terms of our accountability, what we are accountable to clients, what we are accountable to investors, community at large have got uh, very well defined. I think uh, uh, 
a lot of uh, evolution has happened around that, uh, no doubt about it. From a um, uh, uh, client expectation point of view, I think we we discussed the the uh, the, the expectations have evolved quite dramatically. Uh, I did talk about focus on implementations, focus on. Uh, from a technology point of view, I think again there has been a uh, a lot of evolution. I think I, I even heard Mr. Vedyanathan speak about it towards the end. That uh, today, uh, what the evolution I've seen is uh, uh, bringing to clients or uh, solving client problems through an ecosystem okay, uh, of of partners. Uh, we're extremely proud about the fact that uh, you know we work closely with alliance partners like Success Factor. And ServiceNow and IBM, uh, uh, Microsoft. Uh, generally, what we believe is that even at you know you being a very large firm, when you come to you're providing holistic advice, when you're you're you want to ensure that your advice comes arrive into alive for the client in terms of delivering through the right kind of technology platforms, you need a power of strong ecosystem partners also for for bringing those those solutions alive for you. I think that's been one uh, one strong evolution in consulting. What else? Um, I also feel, um, you know, with the proliferation of knowledge today, uh, everybody knows everything. So I'll, I'll give you an example from people consulting again. Um, I've spoken enough about technology. Uh, uh, today, clients ask us, tell me, uh, what do I need to do about hybrid working, right? Uh, a question that most of you would also be thinking about what do I need to do about hybrid working? Should I be calling people back? Should I be saying two days work from home? Now, what has happened is that everybody knows everything. I mean, if you if if it's topic of interest for you, you Google it, you will have everything possible under the sun, research, what companies are doing, all available at your fingertips. So what's the role of a consultant in this kind of a scenario? You know, I say I, I've started believing that the consultant's role is like the navigator in a foggy environment. You know, it's it's information overload. But to be able to synthesize that information, to be able to use your global experiences, your experiences across sectors, across geographies, to be able to synthesize and, you know, be the navigator for clients to, to say what will work for you. I think it's it's been a fantastic, it's been a phenomenal evolution from us being, you know, powerhouses of knowledge today knowledge is more democratically available to be able to help clients interpret that knowledge and get the right kind of sound advice i think that's that's another i don't know if i answered your question but i just surely, thought I'd pick surely, up sir, thank you views. thank you so much for leveraging our own experience and leveraging our own knowledge to solve their problem that's what consultants are made for so that brings to my next question as we are discussing about technology adaptation their implementation so uh, we would like to know what are the biggest challenges that you see the company is facing during the implementation phase of AI ML during the transformation processes. Wow, AI ML now. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to ask how many of you uh, are passionate about AI and ML. Anyway, implementation challenges with AI and ML. The biggest problem is still very basic. It's data, right? Uh, uh, the the power of AI and ML. I'm I'm sorry. I'm using AI and ML together and more generically. The power still lies in having credible data, labeled data, right? It these are technologies that leverage the power of data. Uh, if you don't have uh, in a client scenario, if you're trying to help a client uh, improve efficiencies of supply chain, right? Uh, improve your logistics efficiency. Improve, improve hiring efficiencies. Uh, it the first thing about being able to use AI and ML, all the the jazz apart, is do you have clean data, right? How do you have labeled data? How much of that data is available? I think it's it most fundamentally comes down to that, right? Let uh, 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 another uh, an example from you know my my people consulting domain. Let's say. We use today both AI and ML to improve hiring decisions. So we say that we'll create an algorithm. If you want to hire from XLRI, ask all the 120 batch to send in their CVs. They feed their CVs into a platform and it'll tell you which are, who are the two students that you need to hire. 
it'll tell you who are the, which are the two students that you need to hire. That's the power of AI and ML. All it's doing is it's trying to predict what are the factors. It is it uh, what do you call it? CQPI, right? Is it CQPI? Is it your education background? Is it your involvement in extracurriculars? Is it where? What's your uh, which city do you come from, etc. What's the power of data? It's leveraging the power of data to predict that people in the past who joined from XLRI, okay, uh, if you were to look at the combination of variables, data points uh, of people who did well in your company, stayed on, performed, what, what are the combination of variables that provide for a good predictor of who, who you should be hiring in the future, right? Simple. That's, that's a very simple example. So if I'm able to track the last 50 people that joined from XLRI and look at what are the combinations that what CGPI, what combination of background education, what are the fact variables that together predict a, a, a good hire or a successful performer, I would work on those variables. But I need data for that. So the question comes, uh, does a CV provide me with all that data? Where do I get that data from? All my AI ML is based on, 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 on availability of that data. That is number one. Number two is, um, I think uh, large volumes data also required very high volumes of computational strength to be able to ha handle those data. I mean, I again, uh, a lot of the work that we do, we struggle with once we get loads of data, especially when we are trying to solve supply chain problems, complex SKUs, multiple SKUs. Uh, you need strong computational uh, power to be able to handle that data again to make AI ML uh, real. Uh, Lot of still lot of projects in AI and ML are also uh, a bit of a risk involved. You're investing in resources, you're investing time, not knowing whether you'd finally get an outcome. It's still not evolved technology, none of the domain. So <coughs> there's that risk that comes with it. Uh, still, uh, people who could uh, capabilities available in these areas are 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 not as widely available. So so sorry, I'll stop before I scare people off. You. But yeah, some of those are challenges that uh, you encounter as a consultant uh, yes. implementing any of these projects. Yes. As we are discussing about machines and machines and taking over human. So my next question is upon this, considering the technological advancements in the industry, we are lo losing the human touch in operational activities now. How can we leverage technology in operations, blending with human touch along with the operational efficiency? So... I personally don't think uh, we're losing the human touch. Uh, uh, I mean, all the examples I think about the work we're doing, I think the power of technology is today being leveraged to dramatically improve efficiency, uh, human efficiency, human productivity. Okay, so I don't think it's the uh, this or that uh, debate. It is, you know, how can you leverage it better? Let me again. Um, give you specific examples. Uh, let's talk, start from a simple, um, uh, you know, your frontline field force uh, uh, that's responsible for uh, collecting orders from retail outlets, right? Uh, I think last two to three years, uh, if you look at mature organizations, the, 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 the pads that they carry, they have fantastic information available on buying trends, stock levels, uh, their ability to predict or, or what it gives a, 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 a salesman, a frontline salesperson entering into a, you know, a, a dealer outlet or a <coughs> retail outlet is fantastic. I think dramatically improves efficiency of, uh, of, of uh, frontline retail sales. Uh, if I was to look at now slightly broader view of, uh, uh, since you're talking about operations, end-to-end uh, -end supply chain, I think today uh, uh, technology has dramatically improved the ability of driving optimizations at different points in the supply chain. It's a, it's a truly integrated supply chain. Again, I was talking about dealer, uh, integrated at the dealer levels, dealer stocks, uh, dealer SQ levels, back to your inventory, actually back to your ordering efficiencies and everything in the intermediate, your, your warehousing, your logistics, inbound, outbound, your production. I think if, 
and I'm 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 talking more broadly here, but all elements of what you call core supply chain today, uh, efficiencies have gone up dramatically. COVID was a was a very big uh, again accelerator on driving supply chain efficiencies. You know, so many of our clients, uh, they for for three months for six months they were not able to send their frontline salesforce out to you know, their client outlets, their retail outlets or their dealer outlets. But uh, availability of information, again, based given the level of integrations that they had or what they had to accelerate during the times of the COVID. And then, of course, you've got your more traditional examples of what uh, uh, these technologies have done to improving production efficiencies and, and shop floor efficiency. So it's not the this versus that at all. I think it's it's saying that how is it ten percent improvement or is it eighty percent improvement that you've been able to drive in productivity and efficiencies? Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for this elaborate and elaborated discussion on technologies. Now we will bring back to you uh, that you have been speaking about putting humans at the center of success of large transformation. So now we want to discuss on this. Please elaborate on the the con context of success of a large consulting transformations. Humans at the center. I my my favorite topic, and I know I'm talking to a group that uh, maybe none of you would join uh, in people consulting. I hope few of you do, but you know many of you. Have but I still want awesome, huh. awesome. But I still, uh, I mean, this is an area where I, uh, this is a topic that I speak to very passionately. In fact, this is a I I I asked her to ask me this question. So. Uh, uh, because it's an area you know very very passionate about it's about humans at the center so uh, for years when it comes to transformation programs any kind of transformation when we were discussing a lot technology transformation you may be implementing a, a erp platform you may be implementing a supply chain platform you may be implementing a you may be transitioning to cloud or you may be implementing a a, a you know, uh, operations improvement program, uh, EBITDA improvement program, any kind of transformation, a cyber transformation since we talked about cloud. You know, uh, business leaders for a long time say that people aspect is very important. Everybody says it, that it is success, one of the success, or if you ask clients, ki, uh, uh, you know, isn't the people side very important? Everybody will say yes. I mean, nobody will say no. Everybody will say yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless people don't, buy into it unless they don't adopt it the transformation doesn't work but um, in a lot of cases honestly there is a big slip between the cup and the lip so to say okay over a period of time technology of supply chain operations transformation they think chalo implement the technology karni hai. Uh, human side ho jayega. people will figure their way out and especially in india i mean where the jugad is so uh, so well, what we did was we um, commissioned a research and I wanted to give you a, I mean, since you're all of you on campus, a, a researched answer. We uh, commissioned a research with uh, a, a large business school on saying that, can we understand the difference between a successful and an unsuccessful transformation, right? We interviewed 1000 executives, about 960 or 970 senior leaders across the globe. And we just asked them, talk about successful transformations and unsuccessful transformations. Talk about your experience of going through transformations. Trans it's, it's big. I mean, every leader that we spoke to talked about the fact that they are, most of them are currently undergoing, trans part of an organization that's undergoing transformation. Some of them said we are currently undergoing two to three transformations. You know, a transformation being any significant improvement in process, automation, structure for a, for a marked improvement in business results and outcomes. But what we also realized is that only 30% transformation programs are successful. Successful being, meaning they deliver the ROI, the commitments that were made. So we tried to start distilling the, what's the difference between a successful and an unsuccessful transformation. Asking the same questions that tell us what worked in a successful and transformation and what didn't work. And over a period of time, we distilled six factors. We call it the six levers of successful transformation. And if you look at those levers, interestingly, not surprisingly, I mean, logically, you would say, yes, it makes sense. But interestingly, all six of them were human factors, right? Uh, they were, we've called them purposeful vision, that how, what was the clarity around the vision, the direction that you're 
it was around purposeful tech very interesting that are you uh, are you fully using the power of technology today to land your transformation whatever you be your trans is it landing in terms of systems are you building capability it was around psychological safety are you carrying your people along i it was around adaptable leaders it was about discipline freedom it was about autonomy so six factors and we realized that organizations that implement these six levers have implemented these six levers the chances of success go up by 2.6 times just imagine being able to tell your clients that i know the success of a transformation effort average success is 30% if you apply these six levers it's going to go to 70% 2.6 times the multiplier that's the power of humans at the center and that's why we talk about it so passionately yes it it's coming from a people consulting uh, person but it's something i talk extremely passionately to any kind of business leaders that we talk if it's of interest uh, maybe you should uh, take a look at that uh, that research definitely yeah, definitely sir humans are always at the center of a transformation and as we are talking about people consulting so being in people consulting business for more than 20 years and having consulted 300 plus companies what is the most challenging part while recommending strategies for entire hr value chain for any organization a conglomerate or a startup or a emerging tech i think i've touched upon some of those um, the fact that clients are looking for value creation it's not only about advice uh, clients say that ye to theek hai but you know uh, it, uh, will you be partners with us in value creation i think the other aspect that uh, also has happened is that um, uh, clients uh, expect far more agility today even if it's a it's a six months project you need to be sure that you're showing outcomes in sprints you know what used to be conventional technology product creation cycles you are able to show sprints of improvement so uh, no organization today has the time to wait for ki theek hai ab 6 mahine ka consulting project karo and after 6 months let's review what are the benefits we've got i uh, being able to think through any problem statement or solutioning in sprints and showing value testing a solution fail fast as some of you might use terminology testing solutions uh, uh going live with a solution in one part in two months learning from it improving i think it's 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 very today become very very important in consulting and if i was to talk about one more it's still change management uh you know we uh, realized if i was to look back at my experience of programs that have worked well and have given value and programs that have not worked well the big difference is still change management it may not be only the quality of advice it is did you manage the change well did you i spoke about you know people adoption uh, i took uh, you know i have the leaders really adopted the change have them in change in behaviors have ways of working change etc etc how how has the project or your work landed finally how well have you managed the change process my my experience is that that still is the most important part Yes, sir. as we are talking about agile teams and sprint deliveries, that brings back to my next question: What factors do you think are important for a company when it is focusing on building and maintaining the best team for organization's long-term goals? I think uh, it um, again comes to the power of purpose. Uh, as a group of leaders, as uh, A, a team that's responsible for charting the direction taking the organization forward uh, seen uh, uh, are they aligned around a common purpose is the conviction around a common purpose i think it's extremely important um synergies within the team uh, uh, you know there the the value of complementarity uh, uh, what we talk about in sports i'm not going to go to cricket again uh, uh, but uh, uh, power of complementarity um you know i always get reminded again if this is a topic of interest uh, building successful leadership team there's a framework called the patrick leone frameworks you should look at it uh, it talks about the five factors of building strong teams highly effective teams and it starts with a factor called trust you know is there belief is there trust and then it talks about you know other factors like alignment common purpose so if some of those some of those aspects are there i think those are the building blocks of uh, 
uh, a highly successful team. Yes, sir. As I'm we are just uh, sorry if I'm interrupting. I'm just conscious we're 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 dot on time. Uh, should we just maybe take a couple of questions, one or two questions from the audience? Or... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now I can open the. Yes. Maybe just I I also sorry I I have a cut off at four o'clock. Maybe just a couple of questions. Uh... Yeah, we can open the floor for the uh, batch mates. They can ask any questions. Though. Maybe I'll also stand for a few minutes. Good evening, sir. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, session. Uh, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. So I have a uh, question regarding uh, the aging industries. So for example, energy, power, and utilities. We're talking about agile way of doing things. But in those industries, uh, either we are uh, restricted by the regulation or by the resources. Capabilities are, I mean, the technology can be leveraged, but it's not getting uh, leveraged due to probably the HR uh, people uh, constraints. So as a consultant, how can you address that? No, fair, fair point. Um, no easy answer to, to, to that question. I think as you were talking about it, I was also thinking what came uh, alive in me is a couple of oil and gas clients that I'm consulting, you know, a mining client that uh, I, uh, that one consulted, uh, one worked with uh, some time back. I think the, um, as I said, no easy answer. There are the, there are, the learning has been that there are still some fundamentally strong practices that uh, exist in these organizations. See, it's not, not about a transformation in the sector is not about saying, or some of these organizations is not about saying that you need to look at changing every aspect of those that organization. Uh, there are there are there are strengths. There are structural strengths. There are process strengths. There are ways of working strengths that the organization has. Most of these organizations also have fantastic capacity or capability because in the traditional sectors, the traditional sectors are where you know, over the last 20, 30 years, some of our best talent has gone and spent 20, 30 years. I think it comes down to saying that, how do you unlock some of that for the organization's benefit? You know, what are the clear points of value creation that you can identify uh, and, and help them unlock that over a period of time? Uh, structurally, there may be cultural factors. It may be around capacity building at scale. It may be around saying that, you know, what, what are the technologies that are some of the biggest transformation that are today, today happening, some of the, you know, the most exciting, the most powerful projects that we are doing are with the traditional sectors, traditional industries. Maybe we have time for, sorry, just one more question. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much for your insightful and engaging session. So my question to you is that, uh, uh, regarding the technology application. So I am a personally, I'm a very data, data ent enthusiastic person. So a uh, couple of years back, I read a paper where it uh, says that uh, a man is to a computer science scientist, a woman is to a homemaker. So it's a bias in our own data. So when you rely on that data and try to hire a person, how do you ensure that there is no bias in that? Great point. Absolutely great point. And I'm glad you picked that point up. Uh, um, and I'm glad you, you know, your antenna went up and I, as I was talking about hiring. Absolutely. I think uh, I should have picked it up. Uh, and thanks for that point that one of the, um, you know, one of the downsides, she had asked me a question about implementation challenges. Maybe had she used the word downsides, I would have uh, picked this up, is around biases that the data already carries, right? Uh, and as consultants, as professionals, our job is also, you know, uh, we've started the, using the word ethical AI, right? Uh, how do you ensure or what best do you do to ensure that inbuilt biases that come from legacy ways of thinking are not influencing, you know, future algorithms and models that, that 
so so very very valid point and uh, we we try and do everything in fact uh, when we try and implement some of some of our some of these uh, technologies let's say we're building an algorithm for an hr application in hiring in promotions and learning you have to be even more careful mm, because it's about people it's about that you know your the data the historical data set that you use should not build a natural bias we actually do a test also what we call the ethical ai test we've got an internal committee that reviews uh, signs off on a on a any outcome that uh, Im can imp have an impact on any people related process so so very valid point i'll just but i would still not discount the power that these technologies provide so staying in hiring just since you made that point see interviewing as a technique is fraught with biases if i interview i just interviewed a couple of your colleagues in the other room right whatever you say i was telling them about my xlri experience and my cgpi and so on uh yes i try my best but i i i'm sure i also carry prejudices biases right uh, uh i may not even know that i might consciously for the last 20 years i've been trying to you know ensure that i'm i'm what the machine is doing is trying to take care of as much as possible minimize individual biases that exist right so there is that power that you leverage the power of data which is not limited to an individual making decisions but take your point that it has to you know it has you got to be you got to be careful about biases and prejudices i'm 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 really sorry absolutely love being here i'm sure uh, uh, you have a few more questions i I just need to get onto the road. I have a call at four thirty that I'm going to take on the road. So, uh, if you're okay, thank we'll you so much, session. sir, for your time. Now, I would request Arvind to give a vote of thanks, please. Sir, uh, it always feels special uh, to interact with someone who has walked these corridors before us. And uh, having said that, and in the interest of time, sir, I'll keep it short. So. Thank you for uh, being a part of Fulcrum. We are happy that you chose uh, Fulcrum as the occasion to come and visit us, visit the campus once more. And uh, like you said, uh, often we hear that uh, being people centric is the thing to do, but it was refreshing to see that there's a study out there and there are data points that actually validate and uh, reinforce this uh, saying. So I'm pretty sure all of us would go back and have a look at it. And uh, the batch would like to thank you for being a part of uh, this event. And I'm sure XLRI is proud of what you have done. And we hope we can emulate all, all the achievements that you have done and maybe walk uh, your path as well, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arvin. Now I would request uh, Pallavi to give the memento to, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, all the best. Now I would request Riti and Imran, please. As it is rightly said by Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, once your mind stretches to a new level, it never goes back to its old dimensions. Fulcrum is one of the best platforms for the student who want a career in consulting to learn more about the challenges and trends from the industry leaders. Day one of Fulcrum has come to an end. Let's reflect on some of the takeaways from the various sessions. Consulting is like developing a toolkit for solving client problems. Customers should be provided with differentiated and customized solution instead of standard solutions. Skill sets of people should be dynamic. Consulting is not only advising clients, but they should be part of value creation and integration. On behalf of Cortelia Consulting Club, I would like to thank all the speakers who came to the campus and interacted with the students, all the volunteers who helped in making the first year of Fulcrum a great success. Cortelia Consulting Club will be waiting to welcome you all tomorrow for the second day of Fulcrum. Thank you.